Okay, folks. Okay, let's uh, let's get started. I noticed that there are still a few quizzes upstairs. As I mentioned in my email yesterday, there was a fairly significant portion of the class that, for lack of a better word, I would say crashed and burned on this quiz. Okay? And it's a mixture of factors. One is I will take responsibility. We covered a lot of stuff between the first quiz and the second quiz. I mean. When I started thinking about what I could write on that second quiz, I could pull from a hundred different places. So it did require a lot more work. That's my, that, that's my part of the problem. It is also true that you are graduating in about six weeks, and it's become very difficult to actually keep the incentives up for a 10% quiz. Right? I know it's difficult to do, but the material is going to fly past you if you don't. So if you lost control of that second quiz because you did reasonably well. Remember the first quiz, you, coast, you could have coasted in your corporate finance stuff, right? Because a lot of it was stuff we had already done in corporate finance. So if you did not prepare for the first quiz, you could survive there. On the second quiz, you couldn't draw on corporate finance anymore because this is all pretty much stuff we did in this class. So if you're coasting, please don't coast. Okay. The other thing I want to mention is um, I know that the webcasts are a good crutch to have, but if you make this entirely on a webcast-based class, you do lose something. I mean, it's a, I, a, part of the reason is you know it's a, you're sitting at home, you're watching. Who knows what you're doing while you're watching the webcast? You can visualize what you're doing. You could be drinking a bottle of wine. You could be having six mojitos. I mean, it's it's. It, you cannot do that in class. So the nice thing about being in class is if nothing else, you're, you're required to be here. Whether you're bored or not, you've got to kind of hang in there. With a webcast, there is a tendency because you're watching the webcast, let it go. So this is not directed at you. Obviously, you're here. So you're, those people are who I haven't seen in several weeks, and there are quite a few people I haven't seen in several weeks, I know you're watching the webcast. Okay? <laughs> I know you're watching it in delayed time. So I don't even know when you get to the webcast. You let it bundle up. You watch five webcasts at a time. Okay? If, you, if, you can, if you have to miss a class for good reason, I have no problem with you watching the webcast. But don't make it a habit where every class you're missing and watching the webcast. Okay? So that's, again, not, not directed at you or the people who are not in the, in the room. Last issue. We're going to be covering multiples. The next quiz is going to cover pretty much everything in the multiple section, PE ratios, price to book, price to sales. So we'll pretty much get through much of the second packet for the second quiz. So if you're having issues with the material, the best thing to do is take it in bite-sized pieces. In other words, start with the PE ratio chapter today. You don't have to wait till the day before the quiz. So if you feel you have other stuff you're, you're keeping up in the air, that's fine. No, just I know you have lots of things to balance. But try to kind of keep up the class as we go through, because we do cover hefty chunks of material as we get through. Okay. Any questions? OK, so let's, um, let's return to where we were when we left off last time. I showed you the PE ratio regression, right? The regression for the entire market. But I regressed PE ratios for US stocks. Where I the project will come on in a minute. Okay? Where I regress PE ratios for US stocks against growth rates, betas, and payout ratios. Let me recap again. The reason I ran that regression is I'd first done the algebra, found out what drove the PE ratio, payout ratio, cost of equity, and growth rate. And I structured the regression to see if I could catch the same variables in the regression. The regression had a terrible R squared. Right? I admitted up for 24%. But then I said it's not my fault. I mean, I can't make a regression jump through hoops. I can't make the data do things I want it to do. This is a problem, I said, not with multiples or with regression, but with the use of PE ratios, that it's very difficult to explain PE ratios as a multiple. In fact, I'll show you the regression I left you with. This was a regression across all US stocks, 20, 29% R squared. And I also drew your attention to that coefficient of the growth rate. I said, in January 2009, every 1% increase in growth rate in a US company 
increase the PE ratio by 0.78. Hold on to that thought. That's what the market is paying for growth right now, right? I'm going to show you a table, and this is, uh, this is the table I'm going to start with today, which shows you what the market, so this comes from the regression. Every time I run the regression, I keep tabs on, that P, on the growth ratio coefficient. This shows you what the market has been willing to pay for growth over time. So the lower this number, the, market, the less the market is paying for growth. The higher this number, the more it's paying for growth. Let me go back over time. See this number 2.621? That's the lifetime high, at least across the 15 years I've been running the regression. In January 2000, I'm sorry, let, let me go back. In January 2000, let's take January 2000, 2.1. In January 2000, if you were a growth company, every 1% difference in growth rates translated an increase in a PE ratio of 2.10. I don't know whether you remember that equity risk premium graph that I showed over time. No, the historical equity risk premium. In January 2000, the implied equity risk premium in the US was about 2%. Do you see if you're a high growth, high risk company in January 2000, you had the best of all worlds. The market was paying a huge amount for growth and was not punishing you very much for being risky. January 2000, of course, was the peak of the dot-com boom. You were a technology company. You saw technology companies with high growth and high risk trading at 80 times earnings, 100 times earnings, 150 times earnings because the market was paying so much for growth and charging so little for risk. Let's keep your company frozen in time. It's got the same growth rate and the same risk in January 2001 as it did in 2000. So you're the CEO of the company saying nothing's changed in this company. But in January 2001, look at what the market is paying for growth. It's paying about a third less and it's charging about 30% more. So the same company in January 2001 is going to be trading at a lower P ratio, not because of any fault of the company, but because of what, what the market is charging for risk and what it's paying for growth. In fact, that same company in January 2002 is in even worse shape, even less for growth, even more for risk. So you could be sitting there as a high growth, high risk company and see a PE ratio drop from 80 to 55, saying, what the heck happened here? And what's happening is the market prices are changing as you go through. One reason I find this table useful is you often find, as the market goes into a bear market, that the market is willing to pay less and less for growth. People get so focused on risk that they start charging huge risk premiums and not paying much for growth. Very similar to where we are right now, right? You talk about growth, now people just say, who cares about growth? We just have to survive. But markets do have turning points. And one of the things I found useful in this table is the turning points seem to occur when you see a jump in the price for growth. The price for growth jumps before you see risk premiums even start to come down. In other words, investors start taking their attention away from risk and start looking at growth. I don't know when that'll happen, but one way to spot when it happens is to keep running these regressions to see when you start going back to higher numbers. So right now we're at 0 0.780. That's pretty close to the low point we've hit. I'm going to rerun the regression again using April or May numbers because I'm going to update it using end of 2008 numbers because the 2009 January numbers reflect often 10Ks from almost a year ago. What I'm looking for is, is there been a shift? I don't think the shift has happened yet, but if I run this every three months, maybe I'll be able to spot that shift when it does happen and maybe get ahead of the market. So the coefficient on this regression tells you something about what markets think about growth. And that can be then put in conjunction with the equity risk premium to pass judgment on where we are in the cycle. Any questions on the PE ratio regression? Yes? Why? It's good. Well, then why not have, have a third column with just the risk free rate, right? Don't, don't combine the two. Because the, the, the reason I don't want to combine the two is there, is a ma there are macro variables here. The two macro variables are the level of interest rate and the risk premium. So you're right, maybe the risk free rate matters, but keep it separate. Rather than combine the two and mix it up, if you want, keep tabs on all three, right? So maybe there is information in that collective, looking at all three pieces of information, but there's no reason why, to, why you should be combining the two. Just keep them as three separate inputs. Right? Any other questions? Now, until about 2001 and 2002, as I said, I used to focus only on US stocks. Starting about seven or eight years ago, I've started running these regressions for other markets. Now, I could run them for each country separately. I mean, it's not actually that, that difficult because you have the Excel spreadsheet. You could actually you know, put it in a, uh, into an Excel 
into a statistics package and ask the regression to be run by country. So you'll have a P ratio for India, P ratio for China, P ratio for Japan. The problem with breaking it down too fine is in many of these markets, you don't have enough of a critical mass to actually run the regression. So rather than run it by country, I've actually bundled the data into four groups. One, of course, is the US data that you saw. Here are the other three groups. I took all of the EU countries in the UK and put them into Europe. So no, no, no Eastern Europe in here. That's in the emerging market group. So this is the EU countries, UK, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, whatever. You know, I, they might already be EU countries. But, the, but the, the developed Western European economies are in Europe. I, there are about 5,000 companies in that group. I ran a regression of price earnings ratio against beta, growth, and payout. Exactly the same three variables. The R squared there was much higher. Don't read too much into it. It might be a, I mean, if it happened every time you ran this regression, then the conclusion you draw is price earnings ratios are more meaningful in Europe than in the US. Maybe they're more stable. Maybe the earnings are more stable. I ran the same regression across. There are enough companies in Japan that I can run it separate. And the reason I like to keep Japan separate from everybody else is why? What's the problem with Japan? Those interest rates are so low that if I bundle them into anybody else, strange things start to happen. So I kept Japan as its own database. There, the R squared is 48%. And again, if you look across, beta, payout, and growth. And the last regression I ran, I took everything else and put it into emerging markets. Latin America, Asia, Eastern Europe. I'm increasingly thinking of breaking that down at least by continent. Because right now, I have Brazilian companies with Indian companies, with Hungarian companies, with Russian companies. Okay. I think. There are enough stocks in Asia to carry off the critical mass. In Latin America, you still have a problem. You don't have enough of critical mass, even if you combine all the Latin American countries. So the problem here is more with Latin America and Eastern Europe not having enough firms to do this regression. But these are regressions across four different groups. Here's, here's what I read out of this. There's a, markets have a lot more in common than they have differences. The R squares might vary widely across. And you can see why the emerging market R squared is low, because I've bundled up very diverse markets in there. But the coefficients all sing the same tune. Higher growth companies have higher PEs. In some of the markets, as in the emerging markets, you had the multicollinearity kind of driving them. We talked about the wrong sign on the beta. You can see it there, right? Beta has a positive sign when, in fact, you'd expect it to have a negative sign. So it kind of allows you to see how markets kind of move in unison. So it's actually a very useful tactic, again, in, in markets where you have very few comparable firms. It's to kind of expand your sample, bring in more firms, look across the market, run the regression across the market. Okay? Any questions on, on running these regressions? Okay. What, what statistics package do you guys have? Minita, Minita, is, that, is that the standard package? My suggestion is that if you can afford it, buy SPSS. There's a student version of SPSS that you can get which is like 100 and something dollars. It's not still a lot of money. But if you wait and try to get it, once you graduate, it's again 500, 600, 700 dollars. So try to get your hands on a good statistics package. It runs on a PC, it runs on a Mac. You can get both versions. Yeah. So you know, it's, uh, I find you know, good statistics package allows you more options, more things you can do as you go through. Okay. No questions on the regressions? Yeah. So let's build on this. The notion that price earnings ratios is affected by growth rates is not new. People have always known this. There are stories that have been built around it. And portfolio managers who kind of were aware of this tried to look for simplistic ways. Or uh, let, let me take back the word simplistic, because that, that's just a value judgment. Simple ways of controlling for growth. Here are two variations that I've seen used by portfolio managers who look at growth stocks. One is they say a stock is cheap, not if it has a low PE ratio. Because they know that a lot of stocks with low PE ratios often have low growth. They compare the PE ratio to the expected growth in earnings for the company. So for instance, if your PE ratio is 15, and your expected growth in earnings per share for the next five years is 20%, they say 15 is less than 20, the stock is cheap. So that's the first strategy I've seen. Compare the PE ratio to the growth rate. If it's less than the growth rate, the stock is cheap. If it's more than the growth rate, the stock is expensive. A slightly more sophisticated variant of that is to take the PE ratio and divide it by the growth rate. You see what they're doing? 15 PE, 20 growth rate, 15 divided by 20 gives you 0.75. That's called a peg ratio. In fact, the, the, the seeds of the peg ratio approach, you can see if you read Peter Lynch's books from the, from the late 70s, early 80s, Beat the Market. Basically, he talks about how he, I mean, he was one of the first portfolio managers to systematically approach 
investing in growth stocks. Until he came along, until Fidelity Magellan was created, growth stocks were a side story. Mutual funds didn't like to touch them. He focused primarily on growth stocks. So when he said, this is how I pick stocks, people started to read it. And one of the things he said he looked at was the rate of change in PE and the rate of change in growth rate, which is very similar to what we're talking about. So let's take those approaches. Let's see if they have a basis. Let's start with comparing the PE ratio to the growth rate. If it worked, it would be a great, it would be a very simple way to pick stocks, right? All you need is a PE ratio and expected growth rate. You could basically look for any stock that trades at less than the growth rate. Here are a couple of issues you're going to run into. When I showed you the PE ratio, I looked at what the PE ratio for a hypothetical company was given a level of interest rates, right? 5%, 6%, 8%, 10%. Think of what go what's going to happen to the PE ratio for a stock if I hold everything else constant and just raise interest rates, right? Same growth rate, same payout ratio, higher interest rates, what's going to happen to the PE ratio? It's going to go down. And if you follow the simplistic rule of I will pick any stock with a PE ratio less than grow the growth rate, guess what's going to happen? When interest rates go up, you're going to find a lot of cheap stocks because the PE ratios are going to collapse. When interest rates go down, everything is going to look expensive. You saw this in play between the 1980s and 2007, 2008, is many of these strategies, once interest rates started, because it, when you started this process, 81, T-bond rates were in double digits, 10%, 11%, 12%. So you saw a lot of stocks that looked cheap. As interest rates came down, fewer and fewer stocks emerged through the screen. That's the first problem you're going to run into. The second problem you're going to run into is those people who use this kind of strategy and go across markets. So you're in the US, you look at Bolivia, you look at Venezuela, guess what? If interest rates are higher in that market, a lot more stocks are going to look cheap in any emerging market with high interest rates and in any market with low interest rates. The problem with comparing PE to growth is it doesn't control for the level of interest rates, and it can create a false sense, at least, that you have a lot of cheap stocks or a lot of expensive stocks based on where we are. In fact, I didn't even talk about the risk premium story, but in a moment, I'm going to show you what the ratio of stocks in the US that are trading at less than the growth rate are today versus where they were a year ago. And it's amazing how much that, that number has shifted. Okay. So that first approach, comparing PE to the growth rate, generally doesn't seem to work because it doesn't control for interest rates. So let's look at the other one. You want to divide the PE by the expected growth in earnings. Let's pass it through the consistency test. Numerator here is an equity value, right? PE ratio is an equity value. So when we talk about growth in this equation, the growth should always be in equity earnings. Okay. So you cannot divide. P ratio by growth in operating income or growth in revenue, it's got to be growth in equity earnings. Okay. So when you talk about peg ratios, it's got to be both defined equity earnings. Second, if you're comparing across companies, the growth rate has to be of the same base number. Let me explain what I mean by this. Let's say you have 20 companies for which you're trying to compute peg ratios. Let's suppose this is your sample. Okay. You've come up with the P ratios for all 20 companies. You need a growth rate for all 20, right? Given that you don't have the resource is to estimate growth for these 20 companies, you're probably going to look up that growth rate. You're going to look for an analyst estimate of growth on those companies. Be very careful, because analyst estimates of growth build off a base. You've got to make sure that they're building off the same base. So if they're estimating growth from trailing 12-month earnings, you cannot use current earnings in your PE ratio. Because then you'll be comparing apples and oranges. You might end up double counting growth. Okay? So make sure it's built off the same base if you're comparing across companies. If necessary, you might have to estimate the growth rate for every company. So if you decide to use fundamental growth for companies, use them for all the companies in your sample. Okay? Just make sure that in the process of doing this, you don't end up double counting growth. I'll give you a classic example of double counting of growth that I see with peg ratios. I've seen analysts use the forward PE in the numerator and the expected growth in earnings from analyst estimates in the denominator. Do you see the problem with that? What's forward PE? It's price today divided by expected earnings next year, right? Let's suppose you expect your expected earnings next year to be much higher than this year's earnings. That means your expected earnings next year will be a high number, where your P ratio, forward P, is going to be low. You divide that number by the expected growth in earnings. The problem with growth in earnings from analysts is it's a growth of this year's earnings, of current earnings. So if they see a big jump in earnings coming next year, they give you a much higher growth rate, saying this company is going to grow a lot over the next five years using the base earnings. You divide the forward PE by that high expected growth rate. You've counted the growth twice, once in the denominator as a high growth rate, and once in the numerator by lowering the PE ratio and using expected earnings next year. 
So watch out for double counting, because that double counting can, in a sense, lead you to think that a stock looks cheap when, in fact, it is fairly priced. Okay? And with ADRs and foreign stocks, make sure the earnings are estimated the same way they are for the US. Growth rates are estimated the same way. It's important that you be consistent when you make comparisons across companies. Okay? So that's a peg ratio. What I'm going to actually do first is I'm going to show you the distribution of peg ratios. Again, peg ratios, a lot of simplistic rules. Let's look at the distribution of peg ratios in January 2009. So that's the blue. And January 2008. That's an astonishing shift in one year. Because look at the peak of the distribution in 2008. And look at where it is in 2009. Here's another statistic that tells you how much things have shifted. In 2008, 65% of companies had peg ratios greater than 1. PE ratio was greater than the growth rate. In January 2009, more than 60% of companies had peg ratios less than 1. In other words, if you're one of those people who adopted the simplistic rule, your PE ratio is less than the growth rate, the stock must be cheap. Guess what? There are 4,000 companies out there that look cheap to you because they all trade at less than the growth rate. But what's a more reasonable story for what's happening? Why has the peg ratio shifted so much? Risk premiums have gone up so much that you can't compare peg ratios now to peg ratios a year ago. You're in a very different environment. So that's a cross-sectional distribution. You can already see that if you see articles, and I actually saw an article last week, I think, in the Wall Street Journal, where a guy said stocks trading, and this is a story that's been around a long time, stocks that trade a peg ratio less than one are cheap. And he was still sticking with that story a week ago. When, in fact, the whole world has changed around him, and assuming that a peg ratio less than 1 is cheap, it's just going to get into trouble at this stage in the process. Any questions? So let's go back to that beverage sector. Remember the beverage sector I showed you last week, or last session, where I was the analyst, and I said, these stocks are cheap because they have low PE ratios. Now I'm going to go back to that sector, because the growth rates were so different, and compute the peg ratio for every company. Again, remember. You want to find undervalued and overvalued companies using a peg ratio, right? So the peg ratio is in the last column. All I do is take the PE and divide by the growth rate. The reason I've stuck with trailing PE again is the growth rates I have are analyst estimates, and those are based off trailing earnings. So I've kind of stuck with trailing PE to be consistent. So if you look at the peg ratios, the company that jumps out at you, lowest peg ratio by far in the sector is Hanson. Right? On a peg ratio basis, Hansen looks cheapest. The most expensive, I think, is Coca-Cola bottling, peg ratio of 3.07. Okay. So if you were going ba based on peg ratios, you put a buy recommendation. Hansen looks incredibly cheap. Okay. But the first problem we have is when we say that, we're assuming that all these firms have the same risk. So the first thing that you can already see jumping out is as risk goes up for any given growth rate, the peg ratio should decrease. Higher risk companies should have lower peg ratios than lower risk companies. Growth is not made the same. In fact, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to say, go back to that hypothetical example that I did, and I'm going to try to compute the peg ratio for a hypothetical company. Let's see how the peg ratio changes for the hypothetical. Because with real companies, too many other things are shifting around with a hypothetical. I can keep everything else frozen, just change risk, just change growth, just change return equity, see what happens. So my objective is to ask, what are the variables I should be controlling for before I make the judgment that Hansen is cheap? Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to a two-stage model. You have to work with it. This is the only multiple where a stable growth model is not going to work. Do you see why? When you're talking about peg ratios, you're talking about high growth companies and low growth companies. You're talking about stable growth rates. The highest your growth can be is 3%. I mean, how much variation can you get in a peg ratio? So I'm going to go to a high, sta uh, high growth model. This is the two-stage dividend discount model, which we use for the price earnings ratio. I'm going to divide both sides of that equation by the earnings first, and then I'm going to divide it again by the growth rate. In other words, I want to end up with peg ratio on the left-hand side and end up there. And I have some really bad news out of that equation. The reason equity research analysts like peg ratios, at least claim to, is they think that they've nullified the effect of growth by using peg ratios. I can now compare companies with very different growth rates. I've already controlled for growth in my, in my multiple. If you truly nullify the effect of growth, when you look at the right-hand side of the equation, there should be no growth in there, right? You should have taken the effect of growth out. But have you really nullified the effect of growth? Look at the equation for the peg ratio. Growth is everywhere. Instead of nullifying the effect of growth, you've created this incredibly complex relationship. 
What I mean by that is if I told you the pr with, a, with, with PE ratios, what will happen to the PE ratio holding all else constant if growth goes up? The answer is obvious. Your PE ratio will go up. With PEG ratios, it's going to be very difficult for you to even tell me the direction as to what will happen to the PEG ratio if growth rates go up or down, which is a very bad place to be if you're an equity research analyst because you can't even tell a story anymore. At least with direction, you can tell a story. Here, telling a story becomes a lot more, a lot more complicated. So if you look at this equation, you see payout ratio, growth rate, and cost of equity, the same three variables that affect PE ratio, but the relationship is a lot messier. Growth is in the numerator, growth is in the denominator. Okay? So again, I could ask you to do some calculus, first differential, but let's not even go there. Here's what I did instead. I said, OK, let's think about what the variables are. And it seems pretty obvious, looking at the equation, that risk still matters, payout still matters, and growth still matters. In other words, the three variables that affected PE ratio still seem to drive PEG ratio. So I'm going to take that hypothetical company. Remember the one we used, 25% growth for the next five years, 8% thereafter? I'm going to take that company and try to compute the PEG ratio for that company, because I've set up the numbers. I know everything I need. I plug the numbers into the equation, 25% growth rate, 20% payout ratio, 11.5% cost of equity. That's a high growth phase. 50% payout ratio, 8% growth, stable growth phase. The PEG ratio for this company, given those characters, should be 1.15. Trades at more than one, right? That doesn't make it expensive. It doesn't make it cheap. It should be fairly valued. It should be trading at 1.15 times the growth rate. The PEG ratio should be 1.15. But just as we did with the PE ratio, we can hold everything else constant and change one variable at a time. Right? Here's the first variable I tried changing. I used a beta 1 in my original analysis. I said, what if the beta had been 1.25, 1.5, 1.75? 1 same company, same growth rate, same payout ratio. As risk goes up, look at what happens to PEG ratio. The 25% growth you get for the first five years leads to very different PEG ratios based on how, much, how risky you make the stock. Riskier stocks for any given growth rate should trade at lower peg ratios. There's the Hansen problem, right? Riskier stocks, lower peg ratio. What I want you to do as I go down this list is, remember the PE ratio made the perfect undervalued stock? Low PE, high growth, low risk, high return equity, right? Start doing that with peg ratios. You go variable by variable. We want a low peg ratio, right? You want low risk or high risk? You don't want anything that explains away the low peg ratio. In the case of Hansen, high risk explainer. So you want low peg ratio, low risk. So you got the first variable. Let me show you a second variable. I said, what would happen to the peg ratio if I kept the growth fixed and allowed you to pay out more of your earnings as dividend? In other words, your this is essentially asking the question, what will happen to the peg ratio if I have a higher return equity versus a lower return equity? As I pay out more for any given growth rate, as my return on equity goes up, my peg ratio also goes up. So let's, let's keep moving. Low peg ratio, low risk, high return equity, low return equity. This seems like a 50-50 game. But basically, again, you don't want to explain away the low peg ratio. And as we said, if the return equity climbs, the peg ratio will go up. You want a, you want a high return equity, low risk, and a low peg ratio, right? So far, it looks just like the PE analysis. Pick the variable and kind of work. But here's the one that really scared me. I took the PEG ratio for this company and looked to see what the PEG ratio for this company should be as the growth changes. You see why this graph should scare you? Is higher growth good or bad for PEG ratio? It depends on where you are in the graph, right? When you're here, pushing up growth actually lowers the PEG ratio. When you're here, pushing up growth actually pushes up the PEG ratio. Remember I said with, with, with PEG ratio, the biggest problem is if I ask you what will happen to the PEG ratio as growth changes, you will not even be able to give me a sense of direction. This is why. Growth can cut in both directions. So let's finish the story. You want low PEG ratios. You want low risk. You want high return in equity. What growth rate do you want to see in your company if it's a cheap company? We said you don't want anything that explains away the low peg ratio, right? Where are the lowest peg ratios here? They're right in the middle. You want companies with either very low growth or very high growth. You can live with either, but you don't want companies with the growth right in the middle. You don't want companies whose growth rate is close to the average for the sector. So here's the complete story. You want a cheap stock on a peg ratio basis. You want a low peg ratio. 
You want low risk, you want high return on equity, and you want a growth rate that's at either extreme. Because a growth rate right in the middle would explain away the low peg ratio. So here's the summary. High risk companies should trade at much lower peg ratios than low risk companies. <laughs> companies that can deliver growth more efficiently by having higher return equity should trade at higher peg ratios than companies that deliver. Not all growth is made equal. Just because you grow 20% a year doesn't mean I'm going to jump up and down if that growth comes with terrible returns on equity. And companies with either very low or very high growth rates, the two extremes, will trade at higher peg ratios than companies that fall right in the middle of the distribution. And that part is what makes me uncomfortable. Because you're going to look and say, well, how do I know what's average? You, you've got to make that judgment within a sector. But that makes it much more difficult to work with peg ratios than any other multiple. I mean, if you ask me, I think peg ratios are terrible multiples. They're a very dangerous multiple to work with, but with tech, and especially in tech equity research, in software companies, technology companies, you see peg ratios used all over the place without any consideration to the kind of implicit assumptions we're making about the relationship between growth and PE. In fact, when you use peg ratios, you know what you're implicitly assuming, right? As growth doubles, PE ratios double. As growth triples, PE ratios triple. Everything moves in proportion. And as we see in this graph, that's not true. It can't happen in proportion. Relationships are not linear here. Right? About a uh, long time ago, about 10 or 12 years ago, Barron's ran an article on, uh, they were highlighting a finding that the Morgan Stanley Quantitative Research Group had come up with. This is actually a group that works within Morgan Stanley coming up with strategies for portfolio managers. It's a very, it's a, it's a math, stat, finance group, basically. They go through the data, trying out different investment strategies and seeing if they beat the market. So in 98 or 99, they come up with a strategy that they claim beat the S&P 500 by 4%. And here's what their strategy was. They said, if you buy 10% of firms with the lowest peg ratios in the S&P 500, you will earn about 4% more than the S&P 500. And Barron's picked it up and said, oh, this, this must be a great way to beat the market. You're making 4% more than the S&P 500. All you have to do is buy the stocks with the lowest peg ratios. You see the flaw here? What do we just say about the relationship? If I took the S&P 500 and I took the 50 stocks with the lowest peg ratios and I looked at that list, what am I going to see? A lot of safe companies, a lot of risky companies. Incredibly risky companies. I'm making 4% more than the S&P 500. But is that enough? When I have the riskiest companies in the group, 4% might not be sufficient. But you can already see that. If you get focused on these multiples, it's very easy to miss these, these ways in which stocks can come up looking undervalued when, in fact, they're being fairly valued. Right? In fact, this graph was my response to that Barron's article, and I sent it to them. Because what I did was I took every US stock, and I classified it into five risk classes, from lowest risk to highest risk. Then I computed the PE ratio across the classes. And there, actually, you find that as risk goes up, the PE ratio goes up. Why is that? If I just look at just traditional PE, the highest risk companies tend to have the highest PEs. Because what tends to be true about growth? If I just took risk, and I said the highest risk companies, they also were the highest growth companies. So the PE ratio, actually, the growth effect was dominating the risk effect. But at the same time that the PE ratio was doing this, look at what the peg ratio was doing. The lowest risk companies had a peg ratio of about 2. The highest risk companies had a peg ratio of about 1.1. So essentially, when you pick stocks with lowest peg ratio, don't be surprised to see a lot of very risky stocks pop up in there, because those are exactly the stocks which will trade at low peg ratios. And I've actually seen equity research reports of technology companies where the analyst compares the peg ratio for the technology company. This could be a very small, very risky technology company to the peg ratio for the entire S&P 500. I, I don't know what that tells me. I mean, the fact that it's lower is, I guess, a good sign. But it's not good enough for me to go out and buy the stock because it doesn't control for differences in risk. So let's return to that, that peg ratio that we computed for the beverage company. Right? So there it is. One of your concerns was risk, right? So you know the peg ratio looks low, but you're worried that the risk is too high. So let's do what we did with the other sector analyses that we did. When you're worried about a variable, rather than tell a story, look at the data. Let the data tell you what the relationship is between peg ratios and risk. 
I actually ran a regression of the peg ratio in this sector. So this is the beverage company. There are about 35 companies in there. Against the expected growth rate and the standard deviation in prices. So it's a measure for growth and risk. But the reason I threw growth in there is, we all, as we already saw, peg ratios don't nullify growth. Growth still matters. As growth increased in the sector, peg ratios decreased. I actually checked to see whether there was a U-shaped relationship in the sector. It did really kind of broke down. There wasn't enough variation in the growth rate. As risk the peg ratio goes down as well. The R squared of the regression was about 45%. Again, not bad for, for a sector regression. I took Hansen's numbers, and I plugged them into the regression. Growth rate of 17%, and a standard deviation of stock price of 62%. You plug those numbers in the predicted peg ratio that I come up with for Hansen after controlling for growth and after controlling for risk is 0.78. Their actual peg ratio is 0.57. They're undervalued, if I believe that regression, but by 35%. So that basically means that I can look at Hansen and say, they, the peg ratio is low, the risk is high, but after I control for risk, I still find it cheap. That makes it a cheap stock. That makes it an undervalued stock. I have to tie up that loose end before I make the judgment. I can't just look at the peg ratio and say, peg ratio is low, cheap stock. Look at the risk, look at the growth, look at the return on equity before you make that judgment. The best way to kind of get comfortable with multiples is get, try to get your hands on a few equity research reports. Okay? You can pull them up off online. I mean, we have access to some equity research reports in the library, but they tend to be dated. They're very, they're very limited. But take them. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have to be recent. Just pick up a peg, uh, you know, any kind of equity research report. See what the analyst is selling as a story. Then play devil's advocate, just like we've done in class. If I were, if I were across the table from this analyst, what are the two or three questions I would ask him or her? Because that's a good way of thinking about tying up these loose ends anytime you talk about using multiples. Any questions at all about, about this analysis? So as with the PE ratio, I'm going to expand my sample. As I said, you're going to see this pattern repeated over and over with every multiple. I'm going to define the multiple. Then I'm going to show you the histogram. Then I'm going to do the algebra, analyze the do, do, to figure out what drives a multiple. Then I'm going to try it on a sector, and then I'm going to extend it to the entire market. As I said, by the time I get to the fourth or fifth multiple, I hope you're bored out of your wits, because I, I want you to be able to do, Because I can't cover every multiple out there. Because it's the analyst's job to keep inventing multiples that you and I have never seen before. You know why that's an advantage? Because if you've never seen a multiple, you have no idea what's cheap, what's expensive. So they throw a number at you, you go, oh my god, I don't know what that means. And it's your job and my job, we're on the other side of the sales pitch, to take that multiple and deconstruct it, define it, describe it, analyze it, apply it. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do this. You need the data, which is already there. You need, you need a, a little understanding of basic algebra, but not much more than basic. So let's expand, the, expand this to the entire market. Again, with PE ratios, before I ran the regression, what did I show you? I showed you the relationship between PE ratios and growth rates, right? And I said that good news and bad news. The good news is the relationship basically confirms what we expected. Higher growth companies have higher PE ratios. The bad news is there's a lot of noise. I'm going to start off by showing you the scatter plot for peg ratios against growth rates. And here I have some bad news and some bad news. Here's the first piece of bad news. It is a pretty noisy, just like the PE ratio, there's a lot of noise in the relationship. Here's the worst news. Remember when I ran the PE ratio regression? I ran a linear regression. PE ratio against growth and payout. Yeah. I assumed everything was linear. Here, it's quite clear that I'm going to be in big danger making the assumption. In fact, in SPSS, on most statistics package, when you do a scatter plot, It'll ask you whether you wanted to try to fit a line through that scatter plot. It's a good idea to say, yes, let's see what the line looks like when you fit. This is what SPSS fit to this data. It said, given this data, if you ask me to fit a line, this is what the line will look like. Hey, remember that hypothetical company? As growth changed, you're going to see, this, you see the same kind of relationship. The peg ratio is the lowest in the middle, highest at either end. Sending off a red signal, right? So if I'm going to run this regression for peg ratios, I cannot run peg ratios against growth rate. It's not a linear relationship. It's a nonlinear relationship. You never got to this in statistics. I'll give you a very small hint. I mean, my, the statistics professors are probably going to be cra crazed if they hear the suggestion. When in doubt, take the natural log. 
You know what the natural log does? Part of the reason you're getting this relationship is the differences across companies is huge. When you take the natural log, you know what I mean by the natural log, right? It's a small ln, not the log on your calculator, right? It's a log 2 point raised to the power 2.718. Basically, what it does is it brings your extremes together. It makes the relationship more compressed. So I said, you know what? I, I don't know enough statistics to do fancy transformations. I'm going to try this, this scatter plot. Instead of looking at peg ratios against growth rates, I'm going to look at peg ratios versus the log of the growth rate. What's the cost of doing this? If you have any companies with negative growth rates or zero growth rates, you will lose them at this stage. Because the natural log of zero is infinity, so you can't run a regression against it. And if it's negative, it'll come back as you can't do a natural log. But I looked at the scatter plot with the peg ratio. And this might be just hopeful thinking on my part, but it does look a little more linear. The noise doesn't go away. It's still the noisy relationship, but you don't have that curve in the relationship. Which means if I run a regression, so running the regression of peg ratios against a growth rate, which is what I'd have done in a conventional linear regression, I'm going to run the regression of peg ratios against the log of the growth rate. All it needs is add an extra column in Excel to your data and take the log of the growth rate. So that's just as a precursor. If you're going to run a regression, before you run a linear regression, check out whether you might have to transform one or more of the variables to make the relationship more linear. Try the log transformation. For me, it works most of the time. There are other variations, exponential squares. Usually those widen the differences. They don't help much in finance. In finance, the biggest problem you often have is the variables have such a wide spread that they're creating noise in your regression. Make it a narrower spread, and the natural log does that. So I ran the regression of peg ratios against three variables. The payout ratio, because it showed up in the when we did the algebra. The log of the growth rate rather than the expected growth rate, because the relationship is nonlinear, and the beta, because we know beta does matter. Higher beta stocks have lower peg ratios. This January 2009, actually, I mean, we have all the downsides of the market coming down. One of the, one of the upsides is all the regression seem to be behaving much more you know, in, in much closer to what you'd expect them to than they did in January 2008. Higher beta stocks have lower peg ratios, which is what you'd expect. Higher payout stocks have higher peg ratios, again, what you'd expect. And if you take the log of the growth rate, higher growth companies have lower peg ratios, which is, again, what you'd expect through that middle range of the relationship. T statistics are all statistically significant. The R squared was actually better for the peg ratio regression than it was for the PE ratio regression, which is also unusual, because most years, peg ratios behave like, just like PE ratios. Very difficult to explain. This year, at least, the relationship is much closer to what I can expect. There's one thing in this regression that does give me pause. See the constant? It's a negative number. The intercept is a negative number, which in a regression can happen, right? But when you run multiple regression, regressions against for multiples, PE ratios, price to book, if you have a negative intercept, it can potentially come back to give you trouble. And here's why. What do we use this regression for? We plug numbers in to come up with a predicted peg ratio for a company, right? When you have a negative intercept, you can end up with a negative predicted value very easily. You think, so what? Can a stock trade at a negative PE? No, you can't have a negative PE. You can't have a negative peg ratio. This regression with a negative intercept is far more likely to give you numbers for companies than that you look at and say, it can't happen. It can't be lower than 0. So can I make the intercept is clearly the problem, right? Can I make it go away? If you work with the regression package, statistics package, often you check out the options. One of the options you will see for the regression package is, do you want an intercept or not, right? If you check no, the regression gets rerun with the intercept going through the origin, basically at 0. If I had to do this by hand, there's no way I'd do it. But the package, all I have to do is check the option off. I checked it off, and I reran the regression. And the only difference between this regression and the previous one is that there's no intercept. Normally, I don't like doing this, because statistically, what you're doing is you're taking your best fit line, which is what the standard regression is. And you're moving the line on your own because you didn't like the intercept, right? So statistically, you know that this fit is going to be less good than the fit you got with the traditional regression. But it gets rid of your big problem, which is a negative intercept. One thing, though, is many statistics packages, there'll be an R squared reported for this regression, which would be an astronomically high number. Don't believe it. Because it's, a, it's an R squared that really means nothing because you've moved the line on your own. 
So now, notice there's no intercept. So if you came to me with a company, this is all I would use. I would take your beta, your payout ratio, your growth rate, plug into this regression, get a predicted peg ratio for your company, given your company's characteristics. So remember the Dell predicted P the, that we got? I could take Dell again, plug it into this regression. I'm going to let you try it out, because I want you to get to start using I, I know that you probably never touched that LN button on your calculator for a long time. Right? Use it, because it, in this regression, you can use it to come up with a predicted peg ratio for Dell, which you can compare to its actual peg ratio. What's its actual peg ratio? PE ratio is 12. Growth rate is 10%. So its actual peg ratio is 1.2, right? You want to get a predicted peg ratio. Malik is going to help me here. You want to do it? Let's do it. Um, there's no payout ratio. First thing I want you to do is take 10 and take the log of 10. Actually, I'm sorry, let's say we're do working. Yeah, take 10 and take the log of 10. Multiply that by minus 781. Okay. Uh, minus 1.79. Log of 10 was a negative number? No, no. no. Uh, the positive minus number. Minus. Okay. Minus, okay. Take the beta 1.2. We're going to be in trouble. We're going to end up with a big negative number here, right? 1.2 times 0.622. Is the law, actually, I think this was the mistake. I, I shouldn't have done log of 10. Erase everything. Do log of 0 0.10. Let's see what happens. Okay. Log of 0.10. That should be a negative number, right? Take, multiply that by, my 0 0.78, by minus 0 0.781. Should become a positive number. Growth here actually will give you the 1.79. Okay, write that in. From that, you're going to subtract out minus 0.622 multiplied by 1.2. Multiplied by 1.2, which would be around 0.74 or 0.75, right? 1.05, that's it. So that'll be the predicted peg ratio for Dell, 1.05. It's trading at a peg ratio of 1.2. Please, again, as with the PE ratio, it looks like it's overvalued here by about 12%, 15%. So try this out with your companies. One of the things you have to do is a relative valuation, right? You got your pay growth rate, you got your payout ratio, you got your beta, plug it and see what you get. For some of you, the peg ratio might end up negative when you use that, in which case it's really, you can't use it. From zero is going to be your base. But you're going to get a predicted peg ratio compared to the actual peg ratio that you can then use. So yep. we should use the database for the market we're in? Um, yeah, exactly. You'd use the emerging market peg ratio regression. So Japanese, oh, I wasn't clear what you were asking. Yeah, exactly. So if you're in Brazil, use the emerging market peg ratio. Japan, use the Japanese peg ratio. Um, Europe, use the European peg ratio. It's better to use an emerging market than only a Brazil or... You could do only a Brazil. I mean, the reason I don't do it by country is you. it might work even with 180 companies. The problem with peg ratios is you need a expected growth rate, which means your sample is going to go from 180 to about 25 or 30. Because just, uh, just about very fast, just using past growth, just as well. You could. The, the problem with past growth is if it's highly correlated with future growth, this will work fine. Yes, often the relationship is negative, which is companies that have had high past growth often have negative, you know, the, the expected growth in the future is lower because they've, uh, their earnings are already inflated. But if past growth and future growth are highly correlated, there's no reason why you can't use past growth. You use five years of past growth and see what, whether it works. There's no harm in trying. If it works, use it, right? Because it's a statistical question. It's not a, you can't say, is beta the right measure of risk? It's not even a, that's not even an issue. If you can find a better measure of risk in your market, go ahead and use it. I need a proxy for risk, a proxy for growth, a proxy for cash flows. Whatever works in your market, try it out. Okay? And actually, I, the other thing I would emphasize is you want to keep updating this regression. I'm actually uncomfortable because this regression is already three months old. Now, normally in the developed market, I'm going to say, hey, you know what, three months, not a big deal. But the markets we're in right now, this regression is going to be shifting on you so quickly, just as in any relative valuation, because you're comparing it to where the market is now. You want to kind of update this regression as frequently as you can. On your project, I'm going to let you get away using the January 2009 numbers, unless I can get around to updating it before the next couple of weeks to make it April or May numbers. But you want the most updated numbers in the market you're in. Yes, Mike. Yes, sir. The reason why we then use this quadratic model and it's supposed to linear model is because it's simplicity, or is it? Well, quadratic requires its own structure. Quadratic is just as structured as a linear relationship. If you're going to use a quadratic model or some other complex model, you've got to check the relationship to see if it fits. Right. Right. Isn't that what 
told you that there was a quadratic. Well, uh, the, with the U shaped, it might, it might, it might not fit. You know, the quadratic model actually has a very specific fit to it. So you can get more complex. You can try to bit, bit fit better models, but be careful. You don't want to make the model so complex that you lose that intuitive feel. Even with the logs, you start losing the intuitive feel for the number, right? When I say the growth rate is ten percent, you know exactly what I mean. When I say the log of the growth rate is minus something, you say, "What the heck is he talking about?" So it's you can already see that as you step away even from the basic variables, it's easy to kind of lose connection with what exactly you're trying to measure. Okay. Any other questions? So if you run a regression, you get a negative coefficient. Try that tactic. Take it out of the regression, see what you get. Okay. Remember that Morgan Stanley report that I talked about with the peg ratio? And they put this out, bare and scared. And they must have gotten a little bit of whiplash from people who actually followed their strategy, ended up with these risky stocks, and then turned on them. So about a year later, they come up with a new white page report on what they think is a better strategy. We said low peg ratio stocks tend to be high risk, right? So here's how they tried to make that go away. They said, let's divide the peg ratio by the dividend yield. For lack of a better word, it's called the peggy ratio. Not the piggy ratio, but the peggy ratio. Okay? <laughs> you see what they're trying to do? What kinds of stocks have high dividend yields? It's stable, safe companies. They said, if we can bring dividend yield in, we can make risk go away. But do you think risk is going to go away? You think if I, put, if I try to do the algebra with the two-stage dividend discount model and divide the peg by the dividend yield, you think beta is going to disappear from the equation? I think you're going to screw up this entire relationship even more. Where if I asked you something about risk, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about now. Don't try to take care of your fundamentals through the model. Because that's what they're trying to do, right? Instead of trying to control for growth and risk, they're trying to bring it all into the multiple. Let me create one multiple that's already self-contained, but you can't do that. The relationship is too complex, too nonlinear for you to, go be, go, to be going around dividing peg ratios by dividend yields and say risk has gone away. It might tilt you back towards safer stocks, but this is a very bad way to do it. Okay? So be careful when you see these really complex multiples where people are trying to make the multiple do all the dirty work for you, controlling for growth, controlling for risk, controlling for return equity. Okay? So their dividend, the reason they throw the dividend deal is that's their proxy for risk. And they said, if we throw the proxy for risk into the multiple, it'll go away, but it's not going to go away. So. P ratios and peg ratios, classic equity multiples. Let's move up the ladder. Let's talk about firm value multiple. Okay? Know what the classic definition of firm value is market value of equity plus market value of debt. Again, consistency now says if you're talking about a firm value multiple, the denominator has to be some kind of firm value measure. And if you're coming out of a discounted cash flow background, if I ask you what's the bet best measure of what the firm, you know, what the firm generates, you're going to say the cash flows of the firm. Free cash flow of the firm is after tax operating income plus depreciation minus capex minus change in working capital. That's what we've used in the DCF valuation. So one way to start off here is say what multiple of free cash flow to the firm? Remember, for each of our companies, you have a free cash flow to the firm you computed. What multiple of that number would you expect the company to trade at? In practice, though, when you see people talking about enterprise value multiples or firm value multiples, it's almost never in the context of free cash flow to the firm. It's in the context of things like EBITDA. EBIT, after tax EBIT, kind of half-assed approaches to the free cash. It's almost like they got one third of the way through the free cash flow cap computation, and they got tired. Oh, EBIT time, oh, EBIT, let's stop EBIT right now. Uh, too much work, CapEx, depreciation, working capital, let's stop here. Now, we'll talk about some good reasons why people might stop early. But here's one very bad reason, and to structure it, I'm actually going to give you a very simple choice. Let's take a firm, it's uh, any firm you want. Let's suppose you compute four different multiples for the same firm. The numerator is the same in all four. It's going to be the enterprise value of the firm. So the numerator is the same. The only variation is going to be what you use in the denominator. So the first multiple, you divide the value by operating income. In the second multiple, you're going to divide the value by the after-tax operating income. In the third multiple, you're going to divide the value by the free cash flow to the firm, which is after-tax operating income minus net capex minus change in working capital. And in the fourth multiple, you're going to divide the value of the firm by the EBITDA. Just in terms of lowest to highest numbers, I wanted to rank them. Which multiple is going to give you the lowest number? The free cash flow is going to be the lowest number, but the multiple is going to be the highest. Right? 
Value to free cash flow. So let's go highest to lowest. We want to go value to free cash flow of the firm is going to be the highest highest value multiple. After that is going to come what? After tax operating income, then pre tax operating income, and the lowest number you're going to get is going to be enterprise value to EBITDA. You're saying, so what? It's basic algebra. I'm going to say something that's going to sound ridiculous, but then I'm going to try to back it up. If you're trying to sell something, it's easier to sell that if you get a low number for your multiple than a high number for your multiple. It doesn't even matter the multiple. You see, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about PE or EBITDA. Let's try it out. Let me try a little exercise. On this was about 10 years ago when MCI was in the chopping block and British Telecom was interested in buying them. To set this up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first go back to the free cash flow to the firm multiple, and I'm going to do the algebra. Remember how we did the algebra? Take a stable growth, discounted cash flow model. In this case, I have a two-stage free cash flow to the firm model. Again, that's the present value of cash flows during the high growth phase, present value of the terminal value. So this is like the two-stage dividend discount model stated entirely in terms of firm value. So what's going to be different? Instead of looking at dividends, I'm going to look at free cash flow to the firm. Instead of looking at cost of equity, I'm going to look at cost of capital. But it's the same setup. I divide both sides of that equation by the free cash flow to the firm. Value to free cash flow to the firm is actually a function of only two variables, cost of capital and growth rate. You tell me those two numbers. I can tell you whether you should trade at 5 times free cash flow, 8 times free cash flow, 15 times free cash flow. So I have that equation with me. I'm trying to price MCI to sell you. You're a potential buyer of MCI. I go look up these numbers for MCI. I look up the cost of capital. I look up the growth rate. Let's assume the cost of capital is 10.5%, and the growth rate for the first five years is 15%. That's my high growth phase, and 5% thereafter. Very different era. Higher stable growth, higher risk-free rate. So this is my intrinsic value to free cash flow of the firm. I come up with 31.28 times free cash flow. Based on that cost of capital and that growth rate, I should expect this firm to trade at 31.28 times free cash flow. So I have that in my hand. I come to you. You're my potential buyer, right? I'm trying to sell you MCI. You say, how much? You say, 31.28. Before I even finish, you throw me out. So I don't pay 31.28 times any number. Get out of here. So I say, OK, I'll be back tomorrow. As forlorn as I walk back to my office, I think about why my sales pitch failed. The minute I said 31.28, you weren't even listening to what came afterwards, right? I said, you know what? Maybe I can deliver him a better number. So here's what I'm going to do. I tried first. I said, instead of free cash out of the firm, which happened to be a very low number for MCI because it had a huge capex, let me use after tax operating income. The numerator is going to stay the same. But I'm going to change the denominator to my after tax operating income. See what's going to happen? Same numerator. Denominator is almost five times as high. My multiple drops to 7.25. The next day I show up and say, you know what? I don't know what I was thinking. You're obviously a very canny buyer. I should never have asked you for 31.28 times any number. We've taken another look at the numbers, and I think I can offer you a better deal. How about 7.25 times after tax operating income? Admit it, you're starting to get interested at 7.25 times some number. You're not even listening to what I'm saying after the 7.25. You say, well, but you also realize that you got a much better deal today than you did yesterday by saying no. You say, no, I'm still not interested. So okay, I'll be back tomorrow. I know exactly what to do. Next day, I show up and say, you know what? We've taken a third look at the numbers. And for you, just today, special deal. <laughs> this is like one of those stores you walk in New York City, right? Special deal. I think we can sell it to you for 4.64 times EBIT, which is exactly the same value as 31.28 times free cash flow. But you're not listening again. 4.64, that looks really cheap. You decide to hold out for one last day. So, OK. Next day, I show up. Last offer. Three and a half times EBITDA. Take it or leave it. You probably followed me to the parking lot saying, please, please, sell me the company at three and a half times EBITDA. There are lots of good reasons for using EV to EBITDA. Here's one very bad reason. You can sell some real dogs using EV to EBITDA multiples. Because think of why three and a half times EBITDA sounded cheap to you. Why does it sound cheap? What's the only earnings multiple that we have a frame of reference on that, where we have some idea, even if you're in finance, which you are? What's the only multiple you have some frame of reference on where you know what's high, what's low, what's average? The only multiple we tend to read about in the journal where, we have, where people throw around is PE ratios, right? 
In your, as human beings, we need a frame of reference. Because we lack a frame of reference for EBITDA multiples, we go to the one that we're most familiar with, which is P-E ratio. And 3.49 times EBITDA looks cheap because you think of 10 times earnings, 15 times earnings. That's what P-E ratios look like. You know you shouldn't be doing this. But this is exactly what human nature will lead you to do. If you don't have a frame of reference, you're going to look for something else you're familiar with, and you're going to latch on to that frame of reference. In this case, that's a big factor driving why you think three and a half times EBITDA looks cheap. So that's a bad reason why EBITDA multiples. I mean, I'll tell you something. Prior to 1984-85, EBITDA multiples were almost unheard of on Wall Street. You didn't see them in equity research reports. You didn't see them in acquisitions. They kind of exploded in the 1980s with the LBOs and the. You know. So here are five potentially good reasons why EV to EBITDA has taken off. And why, if you go to any investment research house now, you look at the equity research reports, you'll see at least in some sectors, EV to EBITDA is the key multiple used to pick companies. Here are the five reasons. Right? First is you can compute this number for companies more companies than you can for P-E ratio, right? Because you're climbing up the income statement. A lot of telecom companies, a lot of companies with infrastructure investments will report negative earnings because of big depreciation charges, but their EBITDA will still be positive. You think, why do I care? You remember the bias that gets created when you have to start throwing out companies because a multiple can't be computed? There should be fewer companies you throw out with EBITDA multiples than with P-E ratios. In some sectors, as you know, the cable telecom, it's quite clear that the depreciation is such a big charge that you want to look at earnings before depreciation, especially if depreciation methods vary widely across countries. For instance, the US, because you're allowed to maintain two sets of books. Many companies use straight line depreciation in their reporting books and accelerated depreciation in their tax books. In Europe, you're, you're required to show the same depreciation in both books. So a lot of European telecom companies, the earnings are after accelerated depreciation. In the US, they're after straight line depreciation. It's not fair to compare that number. So by adding back the depreciation, we get rid of those depreciation changes. Here's another factor. One reason I think EV to EBITDA became so popular during the 1980s was because of the leverage buyouts. There you see why it matters. In a leverage buyout, what's your first priority after the leverage buyout? You've done the leverage buyout. You borrowed a ton of money, right? What do you want to do in the first three or four years? You can try to bring down debt. To you, EBITDA is the ultimate cash flow. You use it to service the debt. The fact that you have to pay capex, you have to pay taxes, kind of come after the fact. You have to cover the debt. And you often, when you saw, saw the people doing LBOs, they had a fairly cynical view of capex to begin with. They felt that most managers left to themselves would take bad projects, so it's best not to take projects at all. So you could see why EBITDA multiples kind of caught on. Okay? And finally, and here's something to think, think about. Any time you use equity earnings multiples, you're going to be affected by the different degrees of leverage across company. Highly levered companies of high betas, high cost of equity, it's going to affect the P-E ratios. Enterprise value multiples should be far less affected because you're looking at the total capital, the total cash flows of the firm. So there's some good reasons why EV to EBITDA is kind of caught on. But remember that one very bad reason. It's easy to sell some companies, especially if they're mature companies and bad businesses, using EV to EBITDA multiples. So let's take a look at EV to EBITDA. Now, the, if you, th if you remember the classic definition I gave you for firm value is value of equity plus value of debt, right? EV actually, you see a netting out of cash from the numerator. So the classic enterprise value to EBITDA multiple is value of equity plus value of debt minus cash. In fact, the difference between firm value and enterprise value is very simple. Firm value is equity plus debt. Enterprise value is equity plus debt minus cash. So EV to EBITDA, the numerator of equity plus debt minus cash. At least in theory, the equity should be market value. The debt should be market value. The cash, of course, should be cash. In practice, the equity is usually market value. The debt is usually book value. And the cash is cash. So here's my first question for you. And this is a question I ask of any analyst that I run into uses EV to EBITDA. Why do we net cash out of the numerator? Do you see my question? Why don't we just have equity plus debt? Why do we net cash out of the numerator? Yeah. Well, so is every other asset. No, but enterprise value is the value of operating assets. But um, my question is, why just the value of the operating assets? I, I agree with you. Cash is in, included. Because if, if it is not, it's the earnings of operating earnings. The, remember the consistency issue? We said what's in the numerator should be in, also in the denominator? 
The reason we net cash out is because the income from cash is not in the EBITDA. It comes below the EBITDA line item. It's not because cash is liquid and you can use it to pay off debt. I've heard analysts use that. It's got nothing to do with that. The reason we net cash out is because the income from cash is not in the denominator. And you know what? We've just opened a Pandora's box. Is cash the only asset that has a characteristic? What else do companies own whose earnings are not part of EBITDA? We did this in the context of DCF valuation. In fact, it was part of your second quiz. Minority Minor no. Take that back. Minority holdings. Minority interest is, remember again, that's a whole other kettle of fish. You own 5%, 10%, 15% of another company. The income from those holdings are not part of EBITDA. So to get this right, in addition to netting out cash, what else should we be netting out of the numerator? So have equity plus debt minus cash minus market value or book value of minority. Everything else is supposed to be market value. This should be the, remember the, the nightmare you were running away from in DCF valuation? Because you're all these minority, guess what? They're going to chase you as you try to compute enterprise value. The same issues we ran into in DCF valuation. How do I estimate the value of those 217 cross holdings of the Japanese company are going to be an issue here? Because I've got to net them out of the numerator. If I don't net them, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Any company with substantial cross holdings is going to look expensive to you, right? Because you've left it in the numerator. You're not counting in the income from the denominator. So if you have minority holdings in other companies, you've got to subtract them out. So that's about it. Let's look at the other side of the picture. What if you have 60% of another company? Help me out in terms of what's going to happen to your enterprise value to EBITDA multiple. Let's go item by item. Market value of equity, what's incorporated in there? You own 60% of company B. Does the market know you own 60%? Sure. So the market value of equity is going to reflect only the 60% of the equity in company B that, that belongs to you, right? The remaining numbers all come off your consolidated financials. So you pull the debt off a consolidated balance sheet, right? Unfortunately, that is going to be 100% of the debt of the subsidiary. The cash comes off the consolidated balance sheet, 100% of the cash of the subsidiary. The EBITDA comes off a consolidated income statement, 100% of the EBITDA. We have a problem here, right? The equity includes only 60%. Everything else is 100%. So what's the makeshift approach that analysts use to take care of that? Is there a way I can bring in the 40% that doesn't belong to me into the numerator? Here comes the item, minority interest. Often when you see people compute EV to EBITDA, you will see plus minority interest in the numerator. So what the heck are they doing? They're trying to make themselves whole again. They have 60% of the market value of equity. They're trying to add in the 40% that, because to make it all 100%, the only problem is the minority interest they're adding in is the book value minority interest. This is a hopeless mishmash at this stage. It's it's irredeemable. There is no way you could even read this multiple if price to book ratios are three or four or five. If you're lucky and the price to book ratio happens to be one and the minority interest is correctly estimated, it's going to work out. I tell people if you want to use EV to EBITDA in markets with a lot of cross holdings, first and biggest problem is even computing the multiple. Forget about comparing across companies. When you have minority holdings and majority holdings, getting the EV to EBITDA consistent is an incredibly messy challenge. My suggestion actually is, if you have a lot of cross holdings, try to go to pure parent company holdings. Parent company EBITDA, parent company EV to EBITDA, each subsidiary. Because after you get this number, what are you going to compare it to? If you have five cross holdings and five different businesses, given that you have to make a relative valuation, are you going to do a relative valuation against steel companies, chemical companies, or telecom companies if you're in three different businesses? So when people say they use multiples, because they don't want to deal with all the issues that you deal in cash flow valuation options, cross holdings, cash. Guess what? They're in there. They're just implicit rather than explicit. So as I said, one reason people like to use EV to EBITDA multiples is you get much lower numbers. And one of the things that truly scares me is when people go around with rules of thumb that they seem to have pulled out of their rear ends. Six times EBITDA is cheap. Who the heck comes up with these numbers? I'm convinced with some guy on Wall Street, as he's leaving to go to a bar, yells out of his office. From this day on, six times EBITDA is cheap. And generation through generation gets passed on. Six times EBITDA is cheap. It's like a religion. And this is one of the commandments. Next time you run into somebody who says six times EBITDA is cheap, stop them. Ask them a very simple follow-up question. I think it's a very simple follow-up question. 
ask them what the average enterprise value to EBITDA multiple is for the S&P 500. You know what? I've never got the right answer to this question. From people who use EV to EBITDA all the time, they'll try to give you bluster. I'll tell you what it is for the cable. I don't care what it is for cable companies. Tell me what the average is for the S&P 500. And once you finally get them to admit that they don't know, you've got them nailed. And I said, how do you know six times EBITDA is cheap? Maybe the average for the S&P 500 is 4.5. He said, it couldn't be that low. Well, you don't know, right? If you don't know, don't go around spouting six times EBITDA is cheap, 18 times is expensive, because you have no idea what the distribution looks like. In fact, I keep this distribution on my desk. You're welcome to take it if you want and borrow it and use it. You think six times EBITDA is cheap? Let me count the number of US companies that traded less than six times EBITDA, right? That's six times EBITDA. The red line is the EV to EBITDA, so that's 1,200 plus 1,400, it's 2,000. That's 3,300 companies that you think are cheap right now, if you think six times EBITDA is cheap. I could find you companies that traded two times EBITDA that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. In other words, you can't just look at EV to EBITDA and say, oh, that number looks really low. Our frame of reference is all screwed up. And there are lots of companies out there that trade at two times, or three times, or four times EBITDA that deserve to trade at those multiples. So define, describe. And already you can see why we do the histogram is to kind of dispense with these rules of thumb, to ask the right follow-up question when somebody says, hey, 12 times earnings is cheap. Stock that trades at less than its growth rate is cheap. Price to book less than one is cheap. Take a look at the data, because the day, if you're doing the relative valuation, the data should be the ultimate arbiter on what's expensive and what's cheap, not some guy spouting off from some soapbox somewhere. Right? So EV to EBITDA. Yes, Luis? Isn't it useful when you're valuing an LBO and you know the bank is going to give you a multiple of EBITDA in debt? You have to pay the debt, right? The fact that they're going to give it to you is only half the game. But by comparing right? that debt to EBITDA, which that you know that you see, achieve. that tells you how much you can borrow given your EBITDA. But you still have to decide whether the value of what you're buying. So you're talking about the financing side of an LBO, right? So I have no problem if you use EBITDA to figure out how much you can borrow. Now we're looking at the other side of the picture, which is now that you borrow the money, you have to pay for this company. How much are you going to pay? Okay. So for financing, I have no problem. Use EBITDA. So EBITDA is a very quick and dirty way of coming up with your optimal debt ratio. That's basically what you're doing, right? You're taking the EBITDA and saying this number. But now, once you've decided how much you can borrow in dollar terms, billion, billion and a half, you have to decide whether you're going to pay two billion, two and a half billion, or three billion for the target company. There, you have to decide what multiple of EBITDA is the right multiple to pay for the company. So, on the pricing side, you still have to make this judgment. Okay? So, I'm not saying EBITDA is not useful. I'm saying, as a basis for valuing a company, it's a very dangerous basis if you're not controlling for everything else. Okay? And don't fall for this EBITDA is free cash flow. Free in what sense? The IRS just lets you go, no taxes. You have no reinvestment needs. EBITDA is not a free cash flow. It's kind of a locked up cash flow way up there in the income statement. You're not going to get your hands on EBITDA unless you do some very, very strange contortions to get to it. So be careful. EBITDA is not there for you to just pluck off the company in most companies. Okay? So EV to EBITDA for the US. So six times EBITDA doesn't look that cheap, right? 3,000 plus companies in the US trade less than six times EBITDA. Across the world, same thing seems to apply. At least in January 2009, six times EBITDA is not a dividing line anymore. In many emerging markets, 70% of companies are trading in less than six times EBITDA. Half of all companies in some markets are trading in less than four times EBITDA. Okay. Does that mean they're cheap? Not necessarily. So that's the base. next question I want to ask is, if I came to you with a stock with a low EV to EBITDA, I'm trying to sell it to you, right? Your life is full of people trying to make, sell you things, right? And this is one of the multiple things. Cheap, three times EBITDA, four times EBITDA. What are the variables you want to control for? With PE ratios, is growth, payout ratio, and beta, right? Peg ratio is growth, payout ratio, and beta. Let's see what the variables are for EV to EBITDA. To do this again, I'm going to go back to a discounted cash flow model. Here you're going to see a shift. When I did PE ratios and peg ratios, I went back to a dividend discount model. Why? Because those are equity multiples. Now we're talking about a firm multiple. So I'm going to go to a firm model. I'm going to stay with the stable growth model. I don't want to mess with growth here. Okay. This is the value of a stable growth firm. Free cash for the firm next year divided by cost of capital minus growth rate. I'm going to do a little algebra. 
traditional definition of free cash flow to the firm is after tax habit minus net capex minus change in working capital. That's what we've used through DC evaluation. I'm actually going to rewrite it in terms of EBITDA because it's easier from, a, from an algebra standpoint if I had EBITDA somewhere in this equation. EBIT can actually be written as EBITDA minus DA, right? So that broke it out. And, uh, depreciation amortization. So basically, if I rewrote free cash flow to the firm, I could write it as EBITDA times 1 minus T plus the tax savings from depreciation minus CapEx minus change in working capital. I promise you I haven't changed a thing. I've just taken the traditional free cash flow to the firm written as EB in terms of EBITDA. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this expanded version of free cash flow to the firm, and I'm going to plug it back into the numerator there. Let's see what it looks like. Value of the firm is EBITDA times 1 minus D, T plus depreciation times T minus CapEx minus change in working capital divided by cost of capital minus growth rate. I'm almost there, right? Divide both sides of the equation by the EBITDA. I'm done. I can tell you what the variables are that you should worry about when you look at EV to EBITDA. Here's the first. You have to worry about the tax rate. Higher tax rate companies should have lower enterprise value to EBITDAs than low tax rate companies. But PE ratios are never worried about tax rates, right? How come when you do EBITDA, you have to worry about tax rates? With price earnings ratios, why do we not worry about tax rates? What's a measure of earnings? It's earnings per share, net income, which is already after tax. If you paid a lot of taxes, your earnings per share were already low. Now we're looking at earnings before taxes. So this is not just EBITDA. If you use EBIT or EBITDA, you have to worry about taxes. Here's the way it's going to show up. Let's say you're the telecom analyst for Europe. You're comparing Deutsche Telekom to Irish Telecom. Guess which one's going to be trading at a higher multiple of EBITDA? Ireland, the tax rate is 12.5%. Germany, the tax rate is 38.5%. Holding all its constant, you should expect Irish Telecom to look expensive, right? Much higher multiple of EBITDA. Doesn't make it expensive. Deutsche Telecom will have a lower multiple of EBITDA. Doesn't make it cheap because you're not controlling for taxes. So taxes matter. Second variable that affects EV to EBITDA is how much you have in depreciation. Your depreciation helps you because it creates a tax benefit, so that's a tax benefit from depreciation. In fact, if you take the last three items and bundle them together, CapEx minus depreciation plus change in working capital. Does it remind, remember, remind you of something? CapEx minus change in working capital. No, I'm sorry, CapEx minus depreciation is net CapEx. Change in working capital is investment short term assets. You combine the two in DCF valuation, that's what we call reinvestment, right? So here's the second variable that's going to drive your EV to EBITDA. For any given growth rate, the higher the reinvestment you have to make to get that growth rate, the lower the EV to EBITDA is going to be, which is just a fancy way of saying, if you deliver a high return on capital, you have a high EV to EBITDA. If you deliver a low return on capital, you'll have a low EV to EBITDA. So what's your tax rate? What's your return on capital? What's your reinvestment rate? Let's go to the denominator. What's your cost of capital? You're saying, well, that's going to be pretty similar. They're all in the same sector. But what if you have emerging market telecom companies and developed market telecom companies? I would expect emerging market telecom companies with the same characteristics to trade at lower multiples of EBITDA than developed market telecom companies. So tax rates matter, cost of capital, reinvestment growth. That's it. Those are the four variables. The way I frame this is if I'm trying to sell you a stock with EV to EBITDA, you're on the other side. Here, You just have to go like a machine gun. What's the tax rate? What's the return on capital? What's the reinvestment rate? By the time you ask me the third question, I've hung up the phone. I'm looking for easier prey. Because you want to go down item by item to see whether you can knock off the reason for the low EV to EBITDA. Because here's what your perfect undervalued company will look like on an EV to EBITDA basis. It'll trade at low EV to EBITDA, right? Low tax rate or high tax rate? You want a low tax rate. A high tax rate would explain away the low EV to EBITDA. You want a low tax rate. Low return on capital or high return on capital? You want a high return on capital. Again, you don't want a low return on capital. Okay? So you want a low EV to EBITDA, low tax rate, high return on capital. Low cost of capital or high cost of capital? You want a low cost of capital. Again, you're saying, what chance do I have of finding it? No harm looking. Keep looking. Maybe you will find that once in a lifetime, a company that's truly undervalued. But often, you will have to compromise somewhere along the way. Okay? So let's stop there. When we start off, we will start off with a couple of examples on EV to EBITDA models.